Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfine, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, truth seekers, and truth crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. Hey, before we get started with today's show, I just want to draw your attention to new merchandise. Funkin' Stuff and Truth and Rhythm designs are in, and they look pretty darn cool. So show your support, help support the program, and show off some stylish merchandise and apparel. Only at the Funkin' Stuff store. I am pleased to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership guitarist and composer, Simon Bartholomew, a founding member of one of the most prominent acid jazz and funk groups of all time, England's The Brand New Heavies. After making a splash with its debut album in 1990, the band would go on to release 10 more studio albums, the most recent being 2019's TB and H. Influenced by the likes of James Brown, Tower of Power, and Average White Band from 1991, through 1999, the Heavies notched 15 top 40 singles in the UK and four top 20 on the US R&B chart. Those included Never Stop, Stay This Way, Dream On Dreamer, and Sometimes. Simon, thank you for joining the show. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm rocking. Things are good. I, yesterday, I, I, I went to get my hair cut by, um, I got this free haircut from someone who cuts Elton John's hair, which is not the greatest recommendation because he doesn't have any hair. <laughs> and then I went to see Summer of Soul, mm -hmm. which is the new film by Questlove, which is like um, in 1969, there was Woodstock, which we're all, you should know about if you don't, go and watch that, that's amazing. Um, and it's, it's uh, there was a festival in Harlem. Um, and I think it was, they, they, they intimate that it's to stop rioting. There's a lot of, gospel acts and kind of secular stuff to keep it cool you know and keep the god in there so everyone says calm because it was a heady time and a lot of changes were going on and the film is really like, you've got to see this film i mean you you're gonna cry you're gonna feel good. it was more amazing than i could have imagined thank you quest love because yeah. it was in the crates the, the, the footage was in a, in a basement basically you know for however many years it is, it said I'm not good at the uh, do the math or the maths. 
as we say in England. <laughs> but really good. And then I went to um, an art exhibition and drank too much gin with tonic. So I'm having a hair of the dog. Oh, Reach good. It. So we get you, we get you <laughs> uninhibited here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that film. Oh man, just it actually brought tears to my eyes. It was just so. Yeah. yeah, man, it was moving. People were like crying, you know. Mahalia Jackson, just beyond, you know, really something else. Yeah, I'm hoping. And you uh, know, the whole times and everything was that time is, you know, I don't like the way like things like hippies have been, you know, because the hippies were like tur turning, turning like kind of white picket fence America are upside down in a way and then they got really vilified and, and well, actually they were the first to say don't eat bad food look after the planet let's dance together outside and all that stuff is a great gift because we're still doing it you know and it's all down to things like Woodstock and um and that was the time of it you know and a lot of stuff happening for black people a lot of r resistance you know and and rightfully so, damn right. Yeah. So that film is right in the heart of it, and you get that sense of that. And it's no messing, kind of harrowing, kind of beautiful. Nina Simone, boom, you know. Oh. Wow. But what a yeah. great way. And music is amazing. We're here to talk about music. Music is is one thing that, that you cannot, you can't, you can't touch it. You can't, you know, you can't take it away from people. It grows like weeds out of the out of a, a, a concreted mind you know the weeds grow out like that's how music comes out man it rich or poor music comes level, out the levels of talent of some of those cats too like seeing stevie wonder like that and just oh it's amazing yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah because it's before like he's actually playing this riff on the harpsichord which is like a proto superstition and it's just jamming the place kind of playing the blues you know it's before it's more chordal stuff and everything later on before talking book which I believe is his first sort of like, I'm Stevie Wonder, here I am, sort of out of the Motown kind of pop thing. Yeah, he's, only, he's only 19, of, I think. He's got his cabinet, he's just superstition, I was going to say. He's yeah. touching on that, and then he does find it, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. Um, but we're going to talk about you on this show and the band. And okay. um, I want to jump back, Simon, and let the people know... Um, you know, what first uh, drew you to music and why the guitar? It really was, um, you know, in about 1975, I was like 10 years old. And around that time, I kind of fell in love with uh, rock and roll. Buddy Holly, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Eddie Cochran, uh, Gene Vincent. And also, I had this amazing album called The Many Sides of Rock and Roll. So it had kind of like odd tunes by um, Fats Domino, who incidentally is, was, up to a certain point, the guy who has had the most records in the top 10 like, ever. And he wrote with a guy called Dave Bartholomew, my surname's Bartholomew. So maybe I'm going to go and try and get some of those checks coming in. But um, So I fell in love with that music. And in school, there was a, a teacher at lunchtime. And... Mrs. Wardle, she was no picture, but she did guitar lessons. And um, I learned kind of like, like I basically rock and roll. And um, that was uh, really amazing. And also, it wasn't really like this music you could find easily because we didn't have the internet. So I had like five records, six records, you know, um, and I love them dearly. Um, and it was kind of Americana, I guess, ultimately, which is what the heavies ended up listening to, like black American music and kind of being inspired by that massively, you know. So I'm R&B all the way. I also like Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd and rock and bands and punk and, you know, the Stranglers and, the and you know, I, I like a lot of different stuff. And I've noticed mainly I really, I love music made by bands. That's what I tend to go to. And I'm discovering at the moment a lot of incredible disco music. Um, not like YMCA or like Chic, which I, Chic is amazing. 
but the underground stuff because there were clubs going on and they went on for hours and there wasn't now it's kind of distilled into like this kind of cheesy kind of a thing in a way and the disco sucks movement but actually a lot of great playing a lot of great arranging and musicianship on on those disco records that were the lesser known ones and there's a lot of them because they needed a lot of music to play music all night you know for hours just like house music you need a lot of it to do a whole night because it's you're looking at 10 15 hours of music man you know so Often yeah so that's why i got straight that. too yeah so one of the first things I, I, I was learning rock and roll stuff and then i got like into like i learned all, all along the watchtower and that was cool to learn and Hawkwind's cool to learn. They're this kind of weird space rock band because it's like these little... Du, 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 du. It would be like, um, you know, I had, my, I had an older brother and, and, and he had a friend who had long hair and he lived in a squat and he was like a legend, you know, and he... And he this band's like the Pink Fairies and stuff like that. So it's like... And it's kind of like, I am the muscle. So we're doing that stuff. And then we start getting into funk later on. You know, when you get into the funk for rock, rock is a bit like, you know, and, and funk is like, and so you're playing less, you know, like best example is probably like Green Onions by Booker T and the MGs, where you've got that, the, it's like, ding, 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 ding. and that's like playing nothing. So from the guitar being like a lead instrument, I kind of humbled myself into rhythm and more than the sort of like the louder side of it. But I love all, I love it all. I love everything. You know, you get into certain things for a period and you go back to things and as you, as you probably know and dig it all. But yeah, that's, that's how I started. Long answer there. <laughs> who, who would be a couple of your uh, guitar heroes? I mean, uh, you I might have frozen. But my, my dad also is a big fan of um, um, Louis Armstrong, but only like the early stuff, like 1927, the Hot Fives and Hot Sevens. Um, and he had some like Lead Belly records. And Lead Belly was this guy that was kind of folk and blues. And he wrote some like, cotton, sang some cotton picking songs. He also wrote like one amazing record you've got to hear is Good Morning Blues, which is like one of the most powerful things that I ever heard. And he also wrote the Rock, wrote the Rock Island Line, which was then later covered by Lonnie Donegan in a skiffle band. And in England in the 60s, they had these bands with a broomstick with a piece of string on it. And they were playing like folk songs. And that's the kind of stuff that influenced like all like Jeff Beck and everyone like that. So I've got that kind of background like that, you know, like, but I'd say essentially I'm probably a blues guitarist with a few extra chords in there now, you know, and a, and a bit of different rhythm, but yeah, yeah. I still, ch I still check with that. Are, you know, sort of hero idols of yours on the guitar? Uh, my, my hero idols. Well, you know, um, the, the lost idols that don't make the cover of guitar magazine are people like, um catfish collins you know like from james brown's band um just they just did some there's one there's one riff um on a james brown tune which just it's good it's like a yeah. and you can play that over anything and it sounds good man and that's a discovery of funk which is just like amazing. But um, I love Jimi Hendrix because I, I like his mindset, his, uh, his, the way he places himself in the world. What a beautiful person, a lovely kind of sensitive guy. But even me, he made kind of loud rock. It was so sort of soulful. And he even when he was famous, he'd go out jamming all night and bringing other cats into the studio that were not known. You know, he's like... He was just like, and he's playing, you know, his inventiveness, he listened to his live concerts. They were just a vehicle. The songs are really just a vehicle for him to start soloing. And, you know, if you look at a song like Machine Gun, which is the same time as, you know, the, the Harlem concert we were just talking about, you know, it's it just his music into life, into music, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Um, 
and you know I, I like Jimmy Page and um, I love the guitarist out Cool and the Gang. Just great, like just great. Um, can't get enough of that fucking stuff you know that kind of thing you're just playing riffs you know so you're not going to get the glory but um yeah no, i'd pretty, glorify it right here guitar. right now <laughs> i think that was charles smith on cool the game oh really yeah yeah he's he's dope and and also cool man the bass lines that man's a great man I figured that you would maybe really look up to someone like Nile Rodgers, though, too. With Chic. I mean, when I listen to the brand oh new heavies, yeah. you know. I mean, I was, I, 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 was, I was kind of a rocker, and I bought the seven inch of Freak Out because it was such an amazing record at the time, you know. And um, God, I mean, I've read his book, and I'm, you know, he's just. Just what a lovely cat as well, you know, like a sweet, sweet guy. And just, I'm glad he got plucked out of the, the universe to do what he did, you know, because like the variation and the, and the, and the stuff and, you know, surviving through all genres and working with so many people. And amazingly, um, working very quick. I, I, I saw him talking recently on a YouTube kind of seminar thing was in. Or, I don't know, I heard about, um, they recorded Let's Dance, like tracked it in the studio in, in like, well, he said it was seven days. And the, the, and the guy told him, actually, it was five days. You went out partying for the last few days. Because they tracked the whole thing. You know, that's really quick to make a record. Same as with, um, with um, another record he made. Anyway, yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah, Nile Rogers. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of guitarists to mention. Um, uh, yeah, and I, there's a guy called Eddie Fisher who's like, I oh, know, and I like stuff like that. It's kind of like, um, yeah, I don't know where to go. This is too many. All the Steely Dan dudes, all the solos on the Steely Dan records, you know. Yeah, Walter Becker. Yeah, yeah. Um, and all the other guys that got in, you know, just are lovely, you know. I also like, so like, is it Bert Yance, you know, the folk kind of style, the picking style? I can't do it, but I like listening to that. Yeah, I enjoy the guitar. I, I was saying that recently that I think the guitar is like you hear music and you then you want to start playing an instrument because you've probably heard something. And it's almost like being handed like a, a torch, which you continue and you play on it. And then you hand it on again to the next generation. And um, it's, it's a kind of, every instrument has that, its own background. The trumpet, you know, they will have like these people that you know about and lesser people you know about. And you're kind of like holding this thing for a while in your life and listening and making your new stuff up and making it continue. And then you hand the, uh, the thing over, you know? Just just like the drums going back to the beginning of, of humans, just about. Yeah, the first instrument. I, actually, yeah. the first instrument is the voice. But, you know, yeah. It, it, certainly, yeah. <laughs> Simon, what's your uh, perspective of, you know, the UK uh, with its appreciation and embracing of funk music in particular versus, you know, the American um, approach to funk? Because, you know, I've never been overseas to the UK and I'm a lifelong funk fan um, in America. And there's been some great funky stuff that's come out of the uk but it's not always quite as as dirty and gritty as you might hear from america so i'm curious of you know what the uk perspective is of, of funk music yeah yeah well um it, it, that's uh it's interesting because i recently heard this guy called giles peterson and he, he did a a brit funk special and there was a big dancing northern soul and they were listening to a lot of like kind of american soul music which is not like funk you don't really hear it. it's quite niche it's like what what mods listen to you know and they dance in a different way like dun, 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 in this way and it's like nor northern soul it's called 
Um, because there were these, all these clubs here up north, and a few bands like, like High Tension and a load of other bands, you know, Light of the World and stuff, Incognito, and they did their own version of stuff. It's interesting because also in the 70s, there was a thing called Lovers Rock in England. It was a real sweet and lighter version of reggae. Um, and it's funny with the English approach because it, yeah, it's, it isn't, you're right, it's, it's kind of a different take on it. Um, uh, you know, it's a thing, but you know, you listen to the music and you play it in your way in your environment with your friends and that's what comes out, you know, that's just the way it is with music, isn't it? Um, it's funny because when the heavies started listening to old music, there was basically there was a club in London called The Cat and the Hat and they were playing really old funk, you know, and it was at the time it was called Rare Groove because the grooves were really rare and DJs would even cover up the label if they had a record that no one else had so that other DJs wouldn't have that. So they'd have an exclusive like, and they were, they were kind of bringing back songs like, I believe in miracles, baby, the Jackson sisters. And I really think that England and Europe have a sort of nurtured and kind of revered the past of America and in like R&B in America, it kind of just moves forward all the time. So when the heavies came out, it started playing like in the Fender Rhodes on these instances we heard on records and the clavinets and everything. Um, we were kind of bringing like a, a funk back to America. Um, and yeah, then time, you know, yeah. I'm not saying we started Neo Soul, but I would say people heard us and, um, and it's part of that kind of scene, you know, like, and then hip hop, they were looking for beats, you know, we were listening to records uh for inspiration and and and, and um and then i think people said wow we've got this amazing like ocean deep ocean of stuff which is kind of lost it's just been left behind in history and now with the internet it's all there so it's kind of a groovy time to be if you want to hear everything and anything there's not much that you can't find you know um so we kind of brought uh you know flavors of that back to america really you know to give you some perspective where i'm coming from you know when you guys came on the scene in 1990 i was a, a disc jockey you know in clubs and, and mobile uh, disc jockey work so i was getting all of the danceable music you know from the labels as it came out Ooh. and when your record dropped you know it really was a head turner because like you said at that time there were not that many actual musicians that were playing that style of music, you know, real R&B, real funk influences, where you could hear the actual guitar and bass and drums and all that, and it was more organic. Yeah, yeah. And because of that, you helped bring that back, and it was like a breath of fresh air with what else was going on then. Yeah, I mean, in a way, hip hop was doing it because it was like they were obviously looking, listen to a lot of, you know, your your own culture, which is, you know, is. is uh, Amazing, you know, it's like um, really worth listening to because it just it would, be, would have been a shame if it got lost, you know. And that kind of could have happened had things gone differently, you know. And um, it's just uh, just a fantastic because just the revolution in it and all the, the times and the music, the energy in the music. And it wasn't all. I mean, there were people in England, going to America, they were so in, in the search for, for rare, rare funk records, and they were going to small local radio stations. And there's one story that in the basement, someone found like, there was like seven copies of a local band had a single, made us a record, and it only got played on the local radio. And they found it, and then it's, now it's, you can probably find it on, I, don't, I wish I knew what the record was. But then, they, then they're playing it in London clubs, you know, it's a bit like France with jazz in the in the in the fifties and sixties. You know, they you could go in the front door if you were black and you could, and they liked jazz, you know, and you could go and play it. People moved to France, didn't they? You know, because it was like oppressive in America for some people to do stuff. Um, so this sort of European take on it, it's like it's, it, you know, it's going to have the affectations of 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 the vibes that people are living in in, in their own place. You know, I guess. So that would be the difference in um, the funk being maybe raw at times in America. What what um, 
what went into making that first record simon and um you know were you how excited were you to get that record deal well you know we, we made our first record and the bass player borrowed money from his girlfriend and it cost very little to make and the drive to do it was really from us we, we didn't actually have a deal for the first record but an acid jazz did did put it out but we had a another deal but the problem with it what happened to the heavies was we, we made a record with chrysalis records and they had a subsidiary called cool tempo and our first single came out on that and then acid house came out and we just got dropped because clearly the new thing was this like electronic kind of thing and i was really worried because there was no guitars in it i was like oh no there's no guitars and dance music like i'm i'm done here yeah, you, can cur you can curse on this. It's okay. I was fucked, you know. I thought I'm <laughs> fucked now. <laughs> and um, and then and then 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 the Acid Jazz signed us up, and there were just like two guys with a in in Old Street, which is kind of like now it's kind of trendified and and gentrified, if you like. Um, but they really had like a, a a room the size of I could stretch my arms in that room, you know, like a, in the back of a shop and this sort of thing. Eddie Pillar and Giles Peterson. And they just like putting records out and making things. I don't think to, to really conquer the world, just because they like doing music, you know, which is, the, and, and, and uh, we do come from like, I don't think we ever really thought about like the full thing that would happen to us, you know, like it was like um, just making a record and doing gigs. We were like, we had one guy in the band with a car we put all the gear into his car, he'd drive to the gig, and then we'd all get the, the train and meet there. You know, we were like traveling in tiny vans and it was real, it was real, the real thing, you know, the real deal, you know, this, it wasn't like, here's a million pounds, you've got a record deal. Grassroots, yeah. I mean, it was grassroots, baby. And then someone, this guy called Paul Moshe at Delicious Vinyl, and they made a load of money from uh, the funky gold Medina. Tone look, yeah. You know? And, um, and they heard a record. We actually had a different singer on it. The original version is a different singer. And we re-recorded the songs and added the song Never Stop. And then we're number three in the fucking R&B charts, man, in America. So we're going to America. I'm from the Burbs in, in London, you know, like, I'm in America, like, you get to LA, there's all these oil things going like that, going to New York, like, I'd only seen it on Sesame Street and Starsky and Hutch, you know? <laughs> I'm there. We're there, you know, like, it's kind of it's unusual to be sort of plucked out of like the universe to be that to have that fortune if you like you know what i mean amazing and how, how'd you, how'd you i remember there's a village like where fucking miles davis and Jimi hendrix played i'm like bob dylan i'm like fuck and then we're playing in the village gate and shit and then seeing like um uh, hip hop acts and just fucking uh, KRS one. Uh, I remember this party in there, man, just rocking, rocking. And we had the key to the city in your we went to all the clubs and the bars. It was beautiful. LA, you know, like we saw Ron Jeremy, the porn star. Like, wow. <laughs> it was fucking far out, you know. And we're still doing it on like 55 and three quarters now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're still we're still doing great shows and have a great band. Although the lineups changed and we've had the shift in it, the the um, the essence and the of the band is is still there. You know, how, how did you get connected with India at the beginning? Um, she was she was actually signed to Delicious Vinyl to make a solo album, and she had toured with Al Jarreau and Madonna, um, and she joined the band. And re sang all the songs that the English singer had sung. And she, the English singer, had left already. So, um, and so she joined, and she was just phenomenal, you know. Um, but I think she, you know, often singers, they want to be singers in their own right and stuff. And various other sort of things, you know, there's a bit of like, there's all this stuff that goes on in the world. But, um, she um, was a phenomenal energy. The band as, a, as an entity was incredible. I found a, a VHS tape that my mum recorded from television. 
television, TV. And it was Gabrielle, you know, with the eye patch in the 90s. And she had amazing songs. And she's got a band and they're all like in the background. She's standing there. And then the brand new heavies comes on. It's just like eclectic, mad people dress up so crazy, you know, within the 70s look. And you can, you, you can see why the band was appealing and, and did what it did, you know. You certainly had a lot of um, James Brown and I could hear some Crusaders, Jazz Crusaders influence on there. Yeah. And, um, you know, how how far did you think it, you could go with it, you know, when you were starting out? Did you think it, it might hit big or were you just doing it because you loved it so damn much? We just did it because we loved doing it. There was a club called Dingwalls in Camden Town in London, which is stuck in market quite well known yeah and so this and, and, and this, they were playing like jazz and funk and everything and i was really a rocker and i really didn't know about funk and everything so I, we were going to this club and we, we, we used to play there and so really we just we just we'd get a gig and play a gig and then get another gig and it, there was no i don't think there was any vision at the time you know you, you didn't think like that now people sort of go on the x factor or something like that or America's Got Talent or something. But I don't think we thought like that. I think we just liked doing music and had a passion for it. Certainly if I did, you know. Maybe other guys in the band might have had a vision, like, let's try and do this and that. But I was just there, really, just to, you know, play music. And then, you know, we made a record. And it's funny making the record, you know. And we did not... On the first album, some of the sounds and stuff, we were like, oh, my God, we'd never do that now, you know, like... We got we 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 had the multi track of Dream Come True, the first version we ever did, and the drums are on. You know, you, when you record drums, listeners, you put a mic on the kick drum, the snare, the hi hat, each tom, usually three toms, two overheads to capture the. Psh, psh. But this is like two mics, and it's a stereo recording of the drums. You know, like it's like really basic, like super basic, and we had this other tune called uh, Give Me One Of Those. And it starts, jang, 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 jang. Very yeah, James Brown, one. yeah. And, and then one of the guys in the band had this laugh, it's got a laugh bag, and you, and you press the button, it goes, ha, 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 ha. And it's like a little thing. I, you, you, you might have heard it, it's kind of a thing kids have, you know. Like a little battery operated thing? Yeah, a little thing, and you push a button, it goes, ha, 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 and laughs. Right. You know? So we put that on the beginning, da, 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 ha, ha, ha. We decided, you know, it's like all just like, uh, not really. Um, okay, but, what, but one thing about the record and, and bands at the time is that there's a lot of sophistication in the brand new heavies where we, we use percussion in a way and use reverbs and stuff. And we really cared actually um, moving on, like and listening to a lot of old records, how the drums sounded, you know, and a lot of funk bands would get that kind of bad drum sounds. But we really cared about the kick drum and the sound of the snare was like A1. That was the first thing to get right. You know, listen to like James Brown and then the, yeah, yeah, and the drummer would, we saw in a video of James Brown's show, I had this piccolo snare, which is a kind of more like the funky drummer sound, you know. And then with disco, you have a deeper snare. So we, in the studio, we'll often change up the snares for different songs, with different like um, sounds, you know, different, uh, mood, moods or whatever. <laughs> Does this snare have a mood? I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. So on, and on our last record, we, we paid a particular attention to uh, those things, you know, again, and real strings and stuff and real instruments, basically. Yeah. When, when you came out and you were all blown away by getting to go to Hollywood and, and Los Angeles and all that. Um, <laughs> yeah, man. How, how soon did you go out on tour and did you get to uh, share the stage with some of your sort of heroes or other groups that you were like, wow, we're on well, sharing the we, stage with these guys? But very quickly, um, we shared the stage in London at Wembley Stadium with James Brown hmm. and also Simply Red, who were a very big band. And when we were sound checking at Wembley Stadium, 
we're just practicing and we we always jam like we jam we always still we still like just a quick aside we had a show recently and it was like a, we had a slot at a festival for like an hour because there were so many bands on um, and we went over time and didn't do our last two big hits because we keep jamming in between the songs and like which is really wonderful no one does that it's all like next song click click in the ear you know so anyway we're practicing and just jamming and behind my guitar amp is none other than the godfather of soul james brown standing there in in this incredible he had the kind of like colonel Sanders kentucky fried chicken tie this sort of shades of olive green suit on this is just his normal wear you know <laughs> and it, it was like really into it man and like and he we had an american horn section at the time and he tried to like poach our horn section actually which is a bit of an honor but it was a living in america time of food for james brown but nevertheless he's such an important influence on the heavies and you know it's a real shame that he gets sort of like recorded huh, huh, you know i'm a sex machine you know it's a man's world it's all the other stuff he did, you know. And he was very political, actually. He, he did songs like Don't Be a Dropout and um, Black you know, and Proud. Heroin and stuff like that. He was really try, trying to help, like, America, you know. Yeah. And uh, so Funky President. Wow, what a record. We actually did this one show, and it was like, and we did, we did a cover of that because it suited this show. There were many bands on. Uh, loose ends you got me hanging on a string now and we were backing all these people like omar and various people um and we did the funky president and the, when you play those arrangements they're just the way they fit together the puzzle just unbelievable record but yeah james brown is one person i, I wish we could have made a record with james brown mm -hmm. that would have been a book so we also supported earth wind and fire which was more re well probably about eight years ago now and i just had my first kid and i changed my nappy and like verdine whites in the corridor out there you know the place for like, <laughs> and uh and we watched earth wind and fire like and i'm holding my kid with the ear defenders on after the love is gone it's like wow <laughs> that's a little <laughs> moment for me Living the life. Love right there. Fire. I'm just starting Maurice White's book, actually. I'm going to read that. Noel Rogers' book is, is essential reading, too. Yeah, I've read Maurice, not Niles. Um, I'll have to get around to that one. Yeah, check it out. Um, so, you guys did such a, a left turn on your second record. You went to the hip hop thing. And um, what, oh, yeah. prop, what prompted you guys to do such a radical departure on your uh, well, sophomore record? We, we did a gig. At a, there's this guy in London called Maurice Bernstein. He's American, but he lived in London. He played the flute, and there's all these jams, and there's so many clubs playing funk, because once this one club started, the cat and the hat, then the wag club started playing it. And in Soho, which is the place of where, you know, like Gino Washington and Jimi Hendrix and all the cream and everyone were jamming. The Ronnie Scotts is there, you know. And um, so this guy started a club in New York, at, um, SOB, Sound of Brazil. Um, what was it called? Groove, Groove, the Groove Collective or something like that. Anyway, he booked the brand new heavies. At the end of our show, um, a bunch of rappers came on stage. It was packed, the show, like Q-Tip. And I can't remember who was there, but it was like before they'd all made it, you know, before... This is before, before, like the beginning. And uh, and so someone said, like, you should make a hip hop record, like playing instruments. So we're, like, we're like, we are the first band to do that. I remember like about a, a, maybe a year or so later, LL Cool J did a live band. And that's kind of new for hip hop, you know. Well, when did The Roots first come out? The Roots is quite a, quite a lot later. But, you know, so so we, we did this. We, these guys came on stage using this thing and someone said, make a rec, rec, do, a, do a recording of that. So we recorded a load of, like, grooves and beats and sent them around to the people. And we didn't actually meet them all. But, uh, yeah, one, one of the songs ended up on the Happy Feet film. Hmm. And I've got this, like, penguin that goes like that. Like, my name's Cornelio. Jump on, move on, jump on, move on, jump on, move on, shout, <laughs> 
Um, but that's one of my favorite records because it's real cool, that record. Like it's like beginning to end, it's not like uh, something you might not like. You know? <laughs> like. Volume two never came though. Well, we've all <laughs> talked about it and we, we began, we did a, 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 a one tune with the Alcoholics. Um, they're really hard to do because when you've got a record deal, they want a, a, the record companies want a pop songs record. And so all, all, all credits are delicious final for like allowing that to happen because you come up against commercialism, capitalism even, and that is like a bit of a, a stumbling block in terms of like, you can't tour it because there's like 20,000 people on it. They're all on different labels. The paperwork is, is out, of the, out of the window. Um, but, you know, perhaps we'll do another one. It'd be really good to. But the, the terrain has changed now. It's like a different world, you know. But well, next, really cool. next year will be 30 years since the first one. So maybe it's time. Right. Yeah, yeah. I do love that record though, it's real cool. Brother Sister was, um, in my mind, one of the strongest records you guys did. Um, really solid. Uh, so many good that songs from that. That was great to make. We had this great studio and um, in, in, in London, and Dear moved to London, and she's fully in the band, because she basically re-sang the first album. That album we made together. And, you know, we'd be in the studio, and, you know, she wrote Dream on Dreaming with Dallas Austin. He was like 12 years old and just produced Boys to Men. And fucking number, like, you know, we were just banging, it's happening, you know. And um, it was kind of fun because we were having a real a lot, a lot of laughs. It was really happy days. There's a tune in it called Fake. And uh, I was in the live room and I thought I'd like, put the bass guitar around my neck and the guitar. And I just thought it would be funny to go like, dum, da -da 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 -da. so I play the bass, dum, and then goes the guitar, da -da 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 -da. dum, fake, da -da -da -da. And, that, and, that, and I was just fucking around, and all the guys in the club were like, what's that, what's that, they came running in, jumped on the drum kit, it's all there, like, hey, let's get it together. So we just did that one, like, one day, like, boom, boom, bang, bang, bang. That one, musically, like, that's, that, that, yeah. that yeah. one's pretty, a pretty fierce uh, funk track, fake. Yeah, and it's also got, like, it's kind of like a bit poppy. It's like, like pure funk. It's a kind of fun little track. It's our pogo track. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. It's got some intensity to it, though. Mm. Thank you. 10-ton um, take. That's a really cool instrumental, too. Yeah. It's like... Yeah, because that, that, when the heavies first started, we were, we were in school. And... Um, you know, I was into rock and Jan and Andrew, drum and bass player, were like really into funk, like really deep into like soul and jazz funk. And it was like pirate radio stations and clubs and everything. And it was quite hard to, to hear really. It's un, it's, it's underground, you know. And um, so um, we, we, we got together in the drummer's bedroom and we'd jam on a groove when we started going to the Cat in the Hat Club. Every Sunday we go around the drummer's house. He's, he always goes to the drummer's house because he can't take his kit everywhere. And I would cycle. I could cycle with my amp on my bike handlebars, balanced on my chest, ride one-handed with a guitar in one hand. And I would cycle around his house. <laughs> I could, you know. And when we we just jam on like grooves for ages and ages, like there's, there's a lot of cassettes, and I want to put them into digital, and, and you've got to hear them because it's like. That's when I started playing like simpler riffs. Like, and we had this, and it was Diana Brown and the Brothers was the first incarnation. And we had this real, like, real James Brown and real funky stuff, really good. And we'd have a laugh and do some crazy stuff. And uh, But we made a cassette in the drummer's bedroom and took it to this club that was playing Rare Groove. And in those days, you just had records and cassettes. There was no CDs, you know, they hadn't been invented yet. And, um, and they played our cassette, this tune called, You Got to Catch That Beat. And people just kept on dancing because the records all sounded so different anyway, because they were made in like, you know, all over America in different studios without homogenized sound. So people kept on dancing. 
and a couple of the DJs joined the band and started coming around on the, on the Sunday, you know, and they were older guys. And so they were getting, they, were, they, they, they could put us on, they put us on in their club. And that's how we got our kind of thing going on in the first place, you know, like through that. Like just meeting this guy, they had cut the finding venues to put clubs on. And then after that, the warehouse scene started, which was like proto house scene where you had these big raves and everything. And they'd have like a funk room and a, a hip hop room and a, an early house and more like dance, current dance music, if you like. Uh, yeah, so it really come from like a scene in London it was a brilliant time. All sorts of people going to the clubs, girls and boys, blacks and whites and, uh, and yellows and greens. <laughs> And it was really cool and new because the, the music was new to us. And this guy, English guy, had a record. Posse having fun, Eric B. Not Eric B and Rakim, that was his name. Anyway, it, it, English hip hop was beginning and Galliano, Galliano started doing their stuff. And a band called Push was around at the time. And they had as their lead singer this guy called Seal. And I was at a house party once and I was in this kitchen and I was talking to Seal and he said, I'm not doing the funk anymore. I've met this guy and he put this cassette on in the kitchen on a little ghetto blaster. Like you might listen to the radio in the kitchen when you're having breakfast and so forth. And it was all this like, electronic stuff. And literally like in the next few months, he had a killer with a Adamski, you know, mm -hmm. solitary brother, which is a great bass line. Because it goes on the beat and off the beat, it's like this. Off, 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 off. I like that bass line. Influenced me. <laughs> well, speaking of that, Simon, how did you uh, cultivate your talent for composing songs? Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's it I, I you know i take that very kindly because we sort of play and get a groove going and um and that was the foundations of our music making just playing a groove for our ages hours you know so the groove is kind of important to us um and that later on the more the songwriting became a thing um I don't know, you know, I don't know, it's just, we just do what we do. <laughs> it just comes up, we just, just happen to us, so we just keep doing it, you know. <laughs> and you can't stop that, once you get it, you can't it. Uh, what about in terms of like the group chemistry? You know, how would you describe that? And what's it like when you guys are in a studio? Well, you know, we, we have a band now and, and, and um, it's just me and Andrew, the main guys in the band. But we have like a keyboard player we work with now for like 15 years. We've got a relatively recently new drummer. And the vibe between us all is really crucial to the happiness of the music in the shows and everything. And um, so this vibe is really important. So we, we, we write some stuff and we're just jamming and do that. Some of the things we write individually and so forth. And then get in and play them and interpret them. Um, but yeah, you know, when, you, when you're making music and thinking about music, you're all the time, you're like, I mean, annoyingly to me, I've got thousands of dictaphone ideas. I mean, I can't really pick up my guitar without coming up with a riff, which is a potential song starter, you know. It's kind of annoying, because <laughs> it'll never come out. <laughs> but we don't have trouble enjoying just playing anything. And I, I don't think, well, at times we just like kowtow to what's going on in the world, you know. But we just still do our, just do our thing. You know, if you look at the Rolling Stones, when disco came out, it was a big thing. And even they did some disco records. Mm -hmm. You know, so you, you, one does listen to it, but they're still, the, still like, you know, the Stones, you know. So we, 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 we were influenced by House, and we did some like House music influenced stuff and some other tunes, and then R&B, and obviously hip-hop, made a hip-hop album, you know. It's like, it just we just slot in with stuff, and do our thing you know which we comes out of us individually in the, in the room you know like something when, like that. 
when you guys had those hits in the US, was there a lot of pressure to keep delivering hits or did you not worry too much about that? Well, there, there kind of was, it was like, I actually started another band <clears throat> called Akimbo with the, the drummer from the first Jamiroquai album. Um, because the heavies became a bit more like about songs rather than just like funk, you know. Same argument I think Brian Jones had with the Rolling Stones <laughs> over the blues. <laughs> and um, so, you know, there's one way of sort of thinking about songs that could work on the radio. And that is certainly something which comes into it because you want to be there because without commercial success, you know, finance and it helps you to put the funk on the album, you know, so you can flex it all out. Um, but I did another band because it was just literally just jamming and instrumentals and stuff. And I, what what year was that? Do you think that was like ninety? Maybe you can Google it. <laughs> um, but that was a nice record to make for me because we just went in and um, and jammed. I, also, I'm, I'm mixing my solo album right now, which I did like thirty thousand years ago, thirty four years ago or something. It's too long to bear even saying those numbers and uh i kind of wanted to do a thing like a three piece that would be like cheap to take on the road and like funky rock because i look kind of like rock and i like funk and so it's not ideal but i'm, I'm mixing that right now and that was just there's no hits it's not commercially minded just some some ideas i had i could maybe do gigs with i don't really it's not so nice to think about having a hit record you want to keep it on your on your terms you know if you just start thinking about what's happening and looking what's the hit now to make music like that you you compromise to an extent where you're not going to make a, a genuine music you know mm -hmm. well the group had a kind of a hiatus from 97 to 2003 in terms of new studio releases is that kind of the period you're, you're talking about well yeah and some of the records you made in between, you know, were um, not our, our greatest moments in some cases. And um, I think our drummer was getting increasingly unhappy, you know. He'd always wanted to be like a solo artist and a singer and stuff. And I think it got sort of like darker and darker and he eventually left. Um, I always said to him, like, just make a solo album, dude. I'll play on it for free, you know, dude. Then I had this idea that we should all make a solo album, make a double album and have, like, a side each, like a real bass side, but all about the bass and one all about the drums, like loads of breaks and one about the guitar, you know. And then one side, us all together. I think that would have been a cool thing to do. Kind of like Kiss when they did all solo records. I don't know if you remember that years. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I just read the Casablanca Records book, oh. which is a, not an easy read, but just a fantastic label. They were so cheeky and crazy. And the way They're they wrote Kiss, and they had like Curtis Mayfield, Parliament Funkadelic, and Kiss. It's like, what the fuck are they doing? You know, lots Donna, of kids. Donna yeah, Summer, think. yeah. Donna Summer, George Emma Roder. They made the first 12 inch and then they just they were like cheese ball guys in some ways because they, they were the first people to like take a full page ad out in like the, the music press casablanca casablanca record not even for an artist just for them and they, they never made any money i think they always just, they obviously had money going through and they lived a life you know had a lifestyle but i think they didn't make any money I, it's, they're just wonderful nutters <laughs> those guys and it was so 70s you know so 70s yeah they're making a, a documentary film on neil bogart right now oh really yeah yeah just yeah, yeah but like you said kind of like the kiss album i read about that in the book i mean kiss was really hard to break and they they had one territory in america that, that was kind of buying kisses no one was going for it so they really focused on that and they were quite clever at their marketing then they had this like thing called a a kiss-a-thon or something like that. And they've got everyone in America sort of doing really long kisses. <laughs> Just imagine that now <laughs> with the recent yeah, um, right. wonderful believe, thing. <laughs> believe, it or, believe it or not, back then for a while, my sister worked in uh, 
publicity for Casablanca. When, really? Yeah. What, the late, in the office? Late 70s. And the, camel, yeah. and the trees. <laughs> Have you got any photos? Um, I'm not sure, but I do have um, somewhere around here an autographed uh, Donna Summer record from 78. I, I love the story because George Emeroda made an album for them, first of all, I think. Um, kind of electronic album because he was the first kind of synthy kind of guy. And then he had these demos and it was Donna Summer and, and, um, on them. And she lived in Germany. And then um, he was like, oh, I'll find a, 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 another singer, you know, because she's just my girl, like demo stuff. And they're like, no, she's good, you know. <laughs> And then I think the first 12 inch, I mean, I heard a couple of stories about it, but th th it was seven inches with a thing, right? And th in the gay clubs, they were just playing the same record, like over and over again, like back, back to back, the same record. So they said, can you make us a longer one I, on a big piece of vinyl, like a, a 10 minute version? Because people wanted that. And that was, the, that was the first 12. So there you go, knees must. Kind of a cute story on the 12 inch there. Well, I actually remember too on her first record, Love to Love You Baby. That song on the album was like 15 or 16 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Just like an outstanding, like a moment, isn't it? Like that. And, I, you know, I think I Feel Love is just like incredible. Yeah, that was kind of revolutionary. Yeah, because ooh, love to love, baby. And the story in the book is that they were playing Love to Love You Baby at a, at a party. And someone hit the record player and, and it's played again or something like that. And they were like, oh, we need to like, this is working. And just, they just had it on. Remember the record players that would play again? You put, you put like a stack of records on and they drop down and play. Do you remember that? The changers, yeah. Yeah, so you had this sort of like little notch in, the, in this long pole. You put like five records on it and then it would just play each one and then the next one would drop down on top. Fucking crazy. My other vinyl stories, the, um, the Rolling Stones again, but the, um, their manager, I forget his name, no, the early manager, they got rich and they had a Rolls Royce and they had a record player in the Rolls Royce. Oh, I've heard about <laughs> that, but I've never Before seen it. Before hi so <laughs> record player. I mean, go figure. You must have been like, I mean, I, I remember doing it myself, like, you know, like, selling, you know, like sticking a, a a, a penny coin, like a, a cent coin. Keep it down, yeah. Keep it down, you know? Because yeah. in certain rooms, like, boy, you're probably not good for the vinyl, like scraping it deep. <laughs> There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.